Hey, what's up? Axel Wilkinson here for HitFilm.com, and welcome back to another very exciting tutorial. Recently, Andrew Kramer released a fantastic tutorial over on Video Copilot detailing how to create a cool solar atmosphere effect in After Effects. Being the Kramerians that we are, that's a thing, right? Kramerian? Crimerian? Being fans of Kramer's work, we naturally decided to adapt his techniques for use in hit film. So if you haven't seen Andrew Kramer's original tutorial yet, do yourself a favor and go check it out now. This video is going to focus on translating his tutorial into hit film, so it'll work best if you're familiar with the original. Both Simon and I tried our hands at this effect separately, and we adapted some of the techniques a little differently, so we are merging the best bits of both of our efforts into this video, which is cool because it nicely demonstrates how tutorials created for other programs can be adapted in a variety of ways and applied to hit film. So let's build a star, shall we? Here in hit film, let's create a new composite. We'll name it Sun. Let's make it 10 seconds long and we'll use HD resolution. Click OK. Now in this composite, we want to create a new plane which we can do from the new layer menu there. This will be our background. We want it to be black. And then let's create another plane. We can also right click here, choose new layer plane, and we will call this one star map. We're using the same names as in the Kramer tutorial here so you can see how the two connect. And we wanna put a lot of detail into this plane for when we convert it to a sphere later. So let's use a resolution of 4096 by 2048 and it can be black as well. Now a lot of this giant plane is not currently visible since our project is HD. So in order to see the whole thing while we create our texture, let's right click on the star map plane and choose make composite shot. And we're going to take the properties from our selected layer, which uses the 4K resolution. So now we have a new comp that's the same size as our plane, so we can see the whole thing. And now let's add a fractal noise effect, which is what we'll use to create our texture. Okay, double click on that to open its controls. And now we basically just need to adjust the fractal noise settings to get a look that we like. I'm gonna show you the settings I used, but you can of course modify them as you see fit. I used a swirl type in the appearance. Bring the offset down to add some black areas, some gaps in the texture, mid 40s. And then increase the exposure a bit just to brighten up the areas that remain. In the sub settings, raise the influence to around 77 to break up that texture a bit more and then reduce the scale to around 30. Then let's animate the seed so the texture evolves over time. So we'll turn on animation at the first frame. We'll jump to the end of the timeline and then increase the seed by the number of seconds in the timeline. So 10 in this case. And now we have some movement, but the effect is pretty noisy. So to get rid of that noise and smooth it out, let's enable the center subscale option in the sub settings. Okay, now let's duplicate this fractal noise effect. And in the duplicate, we're going to create some smaller, brighter bits. So to make them smaller, we'll bring this down a bit more to around 50 and then increase the exposure to like 2.5 somewhere in there. Now so that we can see these both at the same time, change the blend mode to screen. And then to add a bit more depth and variety with this duplicate, let's change the seed at each keyframe by one. So we'll change it to one at the beginning here. We'll jump ahead to that other keyframe, change that to 11. And that gives us some extra depth to the movement in that texture. Okay, let's duplicate that fractal noise now. And we'll do the same thing again, but a little more extreme. Bring the offset down even further and crank the exposure way up toward nine. Notice the little highlights that that's adding into our texture. Now in the sub settings, let's bring the influence down just to around 70 to make those a little bit bigger. And another way to add some variation into this duplicate of the effect is to change the rotation of the sub settings here. So as you rotate that, you can see how the shape of those highlights changes. I'm gonna use around 270. Okay, so now if we play through this, you can see that we get some nice movement in that texture. So now we can take that and apply it to a sphere. So we'll go back to our sun and let's add the sphere effect to our star map composite shot. Open the controls and adjust the radius of that. Let's set it to 550. And now create a new point layer. And we'll convert that to 3D. 
We'll use this point to control the position of our sphere in 3D space. But first, let's create a glow around our star. We'll create a new plane. Let's call this plane glow. It'll be white, 2048 pixels square. Click create. And then drag this glow to below our star map. And now we want to create a circular mask. We'll use the camera floor planes to find the center. And then hold shift to constrain the mask to a circle. And option to pull from the center. And we can just drag out a mask to the size of our star. It doesn't have to be exact, but we can get it really close there. And now we will add a blur to that plane. And as we increase the blur, it's going to create that soft glow around the edge of the star. So we'll go around 50 pixels somewhere in there. And then we will duplicate this glow plane. And then in this one, we'll increase the blur to say 150. And then duplicate that plane one more time. We'll select it and hit Command D, Control D if you're on Windows. And in this one, we'll increase it again to 225. Now we can select all three of these glow planes and let's parent them to the point that we created earlier. And then we'll go back to our sphere effect and link it to the point as well. So in the sphere position, we'll choose transform from our new point. And now when we move that point, the glow and the sphere and everything will all move together. Now to light up the edges of the sphere itself, instead of using another plane, we'll use the environment map controls built in to hit film sphere effect. So in the environment map, we can choose a layer. So if we just open that and choose one of our glow layers, now it looks like the glow is actually coming from our star. And that gets our sphere well in hand. So the next step is to create the torch elements, the flares coming off the surface of the sun. And for that, I turn you over to the expert, Mr. Simon Jones. Hey, what's up? Simon Jones here for... No, it doesn't really work with my accent, does it? Okay, now that Axel's kindly created our star core, let's get to work on the emissions. I've actually gone in a different direction than Andrew's tutorial, using some different effects to get a cool result. First up, we need to create a new fractal noise map to use as our texture. As Andrew mentions in his tutorial, fractal noise is by design a very random effect. The best thing to do is to simply play around until you get something you like. But for reference, let's take a look at what I did. I'll create a new composite shot. I'll go for 1080p, it doesn't need to be any bigger than that for what we're doing here. I'll call it Emissions Texture. Once I'm in that new comp, I'll go down to the New Layer menu and create a new black plane, again at 1920 by 1080 resolution. You can just click Match Composite Shot to keep things simple. I'll rename that plane, let's call it Emissions Map. As always, keeping things neat and tidy can make it a lot easier to keep track of your projects later, especially if you ever want to collaborate with others. In the Effects panel, I'll go up and search for Fractal Noise, and then drag it onto the plane. By default, we get that familiar fluffy cloud look. Let's customise it to create a more fiery kind of visual. I'll keyframe the seed first, which will introduce animation into the effect. So on frame 0, I'll activate keyframing, then I'll hit the end key on the keyboard to jump to the end of the timeline, and we'll then change the seed to 10. If I now scrub through the timeline, you can see that the clouds are now undulating and shifting over time. We'll leave the type and interpolation properties on clouds and cubic, because they work just fine for this particular effect. The next thing to do is keyframe the position property. This moves the entire effect around the screen, and I want it to be moving upwards. If I adjust the Y property, you can see it moves the entire fractal pattern. So I'll hit the Home key to jump to frame 0, and once again I'll activate keyframing, this time for the position property, and I'll set it to 0, minus 1000. I'll hit the End key, and then move it way up to 0, 3000. As my comp is 30 seconds long, this moves the texture 4000 pixels over those 30 seconds. Playing it back, you can see that we now have this upwards movement, in addition to the seed animation. Obviously, if you change those property values, you can make the animation faster or slower, depending on what you want to go for. I'm going to scale the effect down a bit. This creates a more detailed look. So I'll set the scale to 85. You can, of course, drop it lower if you want to get even more detail, but I found 85 to work well for this. Moving on to the sub-settings, I shifted the influence up to 60%. This adds even more detail into the texture. 
You don't want to put this too high as the texture will then begin to get too grainy. I also shifted rotation around to 280 degrees. This still isn't looking much like flames, so let's dive into the appearance properties to make the final alterations. This is where everything comes together and we get the look we're after. Colour we'll leave as is because we're going to add colour to the effect as the final step. All we need right now is a grayscale texture. What we do want to do is boost the exposure up and drop the offset down. This creates a higher contrast, crunchier texture. First, I'll adjust the offset to minus 0.5, which leaves only a few small, dim patches of the texture. I'll compensate for this by then boosting exposure up to about 3.4, which brings back highlights and makes the patches more evident. Exposure and offset always need to be used together like this, and it's a bit of a balancing act to get the result you want. So, we now have a pretty cool flamey texture. What now? The last thing to do in this comp is to add a mask to the layer. I'll go up to the viewer and select the ellipse tool, and then draw a circle around the middle area of the frame. I'm keeping quite a big margin between the mask shape and the edge of the comp, because I want to give the mask a really soft edge. So, up in the mask properties, I'll boost the feather probably all the way up to 200 pixels. I can also then tweak the expansion a bit so that more of the texture remains visible in the center. You can also change the way the feather interacts with the mask shape, setting it to only feather inside the mask shape. This is the point where I go off in a slightly different direction to Andrew's tutorial. Let's head back into our main composite, which Axel set up earlier. Into this, I'll drop the Emissions Texture Comp from the media panel. There it is, a big, ugly, animated texture. We need to do some things to actually blend this into the shot. So first up, let's change the Blend Mode over to Add to get rid of the black background. Black ground. So in the Video Copilot tutorial, Andrew positioned various copies of the emissions around the star. I'm going to do this as well, but I'm going to do it using something called the Polar Warp Effect. It's an effect with a cool name, and it has a pretty cool result. So up in the effects panel, let's find the polar warp effect, and then drop it down onto the emissions comp. As soon as it's added, you can see the emissions have been warped into an oval shape. We can now customize the polar warp to get exactly what we want. When Axel was creating the star earlier, he used a 3D point as the main central position for all the different elements. We can now reuse that for the polar warp, so in the warp center properties, I'll set the layer to that same reference point. Ta-da! Our warped emission is now dead center on the star. Now it's a matter of adjusting the range and radius settings to position the emission. Position the emission. Try saying that 10 times fast. Let's start off at the top edge of the star. I'll boost the end radius up considerably so that the emissions reach out to the edge of the outer glow. I'll then drop the range down to decrease the amount of warping, confining the texture to a specific smaller area. I can also tweak the start radius to determine the angle and stretch of the emission. I'll now move the emissions layer to underneath the star map layer. So that's looking pretty good. One of the advantages of using polar warp is that the texture is actually naturally curved around the edge of the star, rather than just being a horizontal texture that's been positioned. Filling out the rest of the circumference is now really easy thanks to the polar warp. First, I'll duplicate the emissions layer. In the duplicate, I'll go in and tweak some of the settings. How much you tweak is really up to you. To start with, adjust the rotation to move the emission around to a different area. So maybe around here is good. I'll also tweak the start and end radius properties to give it a different scale. Just keep tweaking until you get something you like. There's no hard and fast rules about this. I'll also adjust the range. It's about getting variety into the effect so that it doesn't all look like the same animation all the way around. Talking of which, the final step is actually to shift the layer on the timeline. Because our main effect is only 10 seconds long, and our emissions composite shot was 30 seconds long, it gives us a lot of frames to play with. So I can shift this layer to the left, which ensures that the animation is now different to the original emissions layer. Keep duplicating and adjusting the polar warp and shifting the layers on the timeline until you've covered the whole surface. You can get as detailed as you want, adding multiple layers to create a parallax effect if you want. It's entirely up to you. The cool thing is that because everything is linked to that 3D reference point, I can move the camera around and the emissions stay in place around the star. You will notice that the glow isn't currently moving with everything else. That's because Axel didn't quite get around to switching them to 3D, even though he did parent them to the reference point. 
So if I quickly switch those glow layers over to 3D, they'll also now stay in place as required. Okay, that about covers it for this Star of Emissions. I'm going to hand you back to the capable and gentlemanly Axel Wilkinson for the final steps of colouring this thing. Oh, it's, it's me again? I'm on? Now? Right then. As Simon mentioned, the next thing to do is add a bit of colour to this shot. We've created the various elements in grayscale, so now we can colorize them all at once using a grade layer. So we'll add a new grade layer that sits on top of our timeline. It'll affect everything underneath. And let's rename that. I'm just gonna call it color. And then let's add a gamma effect to that grade layer. Now gamma gives us access to the three individual color channels in our image. So we're using a different tool, but the same concept that Andrew used in his tutorial, mixing red and green to create an orange color. Is that right? Red and green make orange? Dig out your color wheel and check the color theory on that if you want, but I'm going for it. Let's set the red to two. We'll bring the green down a bit, but leave some, so let's set that to 0.5, and then take all the blue out. I'll hit zero. 0.1 is actually as low as it goes, but that gives us the look that we're after. If you look closely in the glow here, you might notice some color banding where the gradient isn't as smooth as you like. We can easily correct this in the project settings. You can go over to the advanced tab and change the bit depth to 16-bit float. And that will make those gradients nice and smooth. Now it does also slow things down a bit, so you might not want to stay in 16-bit float all the time. 8-bit is handy for when you're just working up your project. But to get the best quality for the final result, 16-bit float is the thing. So we'll apply that. Now we have much smoother gradients there. Now, since we've set up this entire shot in 3D using this 3D point to control the positioning of various effects, let's add a camera move through 3D space to reveal this star. All right, so first of all, I'm going to convert all of these emissions layers that Simon added to 3D. And then decide how long you want your camera move to last. I'm gonna go seven seconds. And in the camera, let's enable keyframing for the position and the rotation properties. Okay, so this is where we'll end up at the end of our movement, at that framing. Now we can go back to the beginning of the timeline and adjust the position of the camera to create our move in reverse. Okay, so I wanna pan up and to the right, so only a little of the star is visible down in this corner. Something like that. And that will create our camera move. All right, fairly basic. Let's select these keyframes at the end and right click and we'll change the interpolation on those to smooth in so that the end of our movement smooths out a little bit. And there's our camera move. Now, when, when we're panned off of the star like this, considering this should be space, I find your lack of stars disturbing. So what the heck, let's make some. I'm going to do this using particles. Uh, the technique was covered in a tutorial Simon did quite a while back. So I'm gonna move pretty fast, but if you want a more detailed explanation, go ahead and reference his tutorial. Okay, so I add a particle layer in the emitter. I'm gonna change it to sphere and then change the radius of the sphere to 10,000 and enable the boundary option. All right, now in the particle system, in the movement, set the speed to zero, set the life to 20. And then up in the general controls, we'll set the time shift to minus five. So particles are being created for five seconds before the timeline begins. Then we can adjust the particles per second until we have a density to the star field that we're happy with. Somewhere around 400 there looks pretty good to me. So now enable keyframing for that property. Then we'll advance one frame on the timeline. Just hit period to step forward one and set the particles per second to zero to stop any new stars from being created during the shot. All right, in the appearance, let's add a texture. I'm gonna to switch to the built-in textures and I know it's out of frame, but Sparks Star is the texture I'm using. I wanna create a little bit more variation to the size of the stars. So at the scale, I'm gonna set that to 70 to make them a little bit smaller. And then in the movement variation scale, set that to 70 as well. And that gives us some more variety in the size of the stars. So that looks pretty good. The last thing to do is to push this layer down 
until it's just above our background. So below these three glow layers. That way it stays behind the star. And there we go. Now all of our elements are in place. I just want to do a touch of final grading to this shot to finish it off. It's looking pretty good, but let's add a new grade layer. That way I can keep the grading separate from our colorization, which happens on this layer. And the first thing I want to add is a displacement effect. And if we jump ahead to where the star is visible, this is going to just create a bit of a heat haze around the star there. So in the displacement for the source layer, choose any one of these emission textures, set both horizontal and vertical to use the red channel, and then increase this to 10 in each direction. Okay, so you can kind of see the distortion on the edge there in particular where we're getting a little bit of that heat haze in front of the star. Now let's add an anamorphic lens flare. And I want this streak to run horizontally instead of vertically. And then it's a bit intense, so let's adjust the threshold of the effect up to 0.9. Just make that a bit more subtle. And the length of this streak will double to around 150. Then... Lens dirt. Ah yes, lens dirt. We've got to have some lens dirt for Simon. But I want to keep this fairly subtle. So in the lens dirt, we'll set the threshold to 0.77. The intensity will bring down to 0.6 and increase the blur just a touch to 30. All right, that's looking good. Now let's add the Cine style effect. And this gives us a pretty dramatic color shift and a few other things. I don't really want the color shift so much. It's this contrast curve, the S curve that I'm after. So I'm gonna leave that at 50 and bring the color down to 15. I'm gonna get rid of the letterbox. I don't need that. I don't need the vignette. So I'll disable that. Okay, a little bit more of a light flare would do nicely. So let's add a new plane. It'll be black. We'll call this light flare. Clever, clever. And we'll drag it down below this gray layer and set its blend mode to screen. Then add a light flare effect. Boom. Okay, for the type, use the chromatic arc in the hotspot position we're going to use our new point layer and zero out that center. It's pretty intense there. So let's reduce that intensity by half to 0.5. And then just to soften that effect up a little bit more, let's add a blur. The default setting there of five pixels is fine. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna do is open the properties for our background layer. And instead of this pure black, I'm going to give it just a hint of red. Okay, so on our background, open the layer properties, open the color, I'm going to go red, and then bring it almost all the way down. Okay, it still looks pretty much black, but with the colorizing that we have going on, it just kind of enhances the glow spreading out from this star. Since the star is always in frame, that helps to blend the effect nicely in with the background and create a cohesive result. And that's looking good. However, I noticed the hot spot from the center of our light flare is visible there. So let's just switch to our flare layer. And here in the hot spot controls, set the brightness on that to zero. So now I will render that and see how it looks. It is our hope that this tutorial has demonstrated how you can take tutorials created for other software, such as the many excellent tutorials Andrew Kramer has over at videocopilot.net, and adapt them for use in HitFilm. Some of the techniques and tools will translate directly, and for other bits, you may need to focus on the concepts that are being used and how those can translate from one software to another. The majority of effects work is not about creating something that has never been seen before, but rather involves repeating, adapting, and improving on work that has come before. So whether you are learning techniques from Andrew's tutorials over at Video Copilot, from Ryan over at Film Riot, me and Simon here at HitFilm, or from some other creators of tutorials, the concepts behind those tutorials can help you out no matter what software you are using. So thank you very much for watching this tutorial. A big thanks to Andrew Kramer for the excellent original that we were adapting here. Please make sure to visit Video Copilot if you haven't as Andrew has some really great stuff there. And check out the other videos on our channel as well. And with that, both Simon and I bid you farewell until next time.